The Arctic Institute of North America at the University of Calgary is a nonprofit research institution that's part of the University of Calgary. It was created by an act of parliament in 1945 and it's Canada's oldest and first Arctic research institution. It was originally housed at McGill University in Montreal, but it has been at the University of Calgary since 1976. For me, the Arctic Institute of North America is a melting pot of interdisciplinary research in which we try to advance the study of the physical, environmental and social conditions in the American North as well as in the overall circumpolar Arctic region. The Institute has a broad mandate to study the arts and humanities, the social sciences and the natural sciences and to share the outcomes of that research with the broadest possible audience from academics to the general public to people who live in the North. So what we're doing at the Arctic Institute is merging historic data with contemporary data. The historic data sets are coming from things like topographic sheets as well as from wheeling logbooks and the contemporary data sets are coming from things like aerial images, Landsat, as well as LiDAR data. In doing so, it provides the most statistically robust estimation of how the shoreline is varying over time. Whaling was the first oil boom it lubricated the start of the Industrial Revolution. For 300 years, sailors would sail up to the Arctic to hunt for the bowhead whale. Uh, here they would track the sea ice edge where the bowhead whale lived, uh, recording every day in their logbooks what the weather was doing, what the sea ice was doing, the animals they encountered. Uh, and from this I can look back into the past and see where that sea ice was and what the climate was doing. Robert Peary was uh, an American Arctic explorer who made a number of attempts to reach the North Pole in the early 20th century. The records that we're looking at for this project come from his 1905-06 expedition. They were recorded by his engineer, Ross Marvin. The records that Ross Marvin kept in his logbook consist of weather data, so four times a day he recorded temperature and barometric pressure, but he also recorded the results of hunting expeditions and uh, ice conditions around the ship during the winter. Currently in Baffin Bay, the sea ice melts back in its entirety during the summer, um, and this has been much the case since we started recording it. However, using the whaling logbooks and looking back into the past, um, 200 years ago we can see that the sea ice didn't melt back in its entire and was present year round. Prior to 1950 and the establishment of the station at Alert, we had no climate information for that region. The great value of these logbooks is that they allowed us to look at climate prior to this period and give us a better idea of trends of climate over time. It's very important to understand how the shoreline is moving in response to both geological and hydrodynamic factors. What we're seeing happening is globally there is a, a natural movement of populations towards the coast. In the US alone, since 2010, almost 120 million people are now residing in coastal shoreline counties. So with the near-term impacts and the near-term effects of climate change, understanding how the shoreline is going to respond to these factors, it's critically important to establish proper mitigative and adaptation measures to deal with the impacts of climate change. Arctic environmental change is a complex phenomenon. Truly understanding it requires cooperation and collaboration across disciplines and the expert input of people who've lived in the Arctic for generations. I think the solutions for addressing climate change have to do with using local perspectives and local solutions. There's not a, a one-size-fits-all solution to climate change. It's about addressing uh, local concerns and local challenges through solutions that have been generated locally, supported locally and, uh, and ultimately will be sustained in the long term uh, because of that. One of the ways we like to extend our reach here is to actively involve people within our research. Uh, I run a program within schools here in Calgary where grade 10 students can actively engage with my research and contribute to it. Uh, I hope by doing this it'll get them to think deeper about the issue of climate change, uh, decisions they can make which will affect that and you know possibly interest them in a career in research. With the amplified signals that we have been seeing in the Arctic, especially in the recent past, it's important that this research acts as a catalyst to ensuring that policy relevant measures are enacted because we want to ensure that those protect both the human and marine systems that occupy the coastal zone. The Arctic climate is changing faster than any other region on the planet and, and this has global implications. We need a worldwide commitment to the reduction of industrial emissions um, in order to reduce our impact on the climate. Um, life in the Arctic is already 
having to adapt to climate change and the risk of disappearing as we know it. Climate change is undeniably one of the greatest threats that humans, wildlife and the planet faces. I believe that as a scientist we have begun to see an integration of efforts across varying sectors that have really started to deal with this issue and confront it head on. My hope is that we will continue to have efforts that really communicate the, the essence of strong quantitative science and how science can influence policy and how policy can actually help both the human and marine systems in the Arctic. The rapid pace of Arctic environmental change presents real scientific and societal challenges. It's time for us to step up to the plate and really figure out what we're going to do about it. And in our own small way, that's what we're trying to do here at the Arctic Institute.